All right, so thank you very much to the organizers for entering our paper on the program. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So the, the paper we presented, a paper on the Great Recession, this is joint work with Holger Müller at Emory. There is a large and very prominent literature in microeconomics, going back to the work of Bernard Gertler, arguing that firms' balance sheets, and specifically the strength of their balance sheets, plays an important role for the propagation and amplification of business cycle shocks. And yet it turns out that in the literature on the Great Recession, and also in the policy debate, there has been very little interest for firms' balance sheets. Instead, the focus has been almost entirely on household balance sheets, and financial intermediaries' balance sheets. So what could be the reason why firms' balance sheets have received so little attention? Well, a look at these two figures may give us some answers. So what you see here is the evolution of household leverage, leverage of its investment banks, and leverage of non-financial firms. As you can see, we observe the, the well-documented fact that in the run-up uh, leading to the Great Recession, there has been this significant increase in household leverage. Similarly, if you look at investment banks, uh, you see that their leverage was already high to begin with, and then it grows even further. In contrast, if you look at non financial firms, you see that their leverage was pretty much flat. And so perhaps this implies that firm leverage just didn't matter during the Great Recession. Now, in this paper, uh, we argue that firms' balance sheets, and hence firm leverage, were in fact instrumental in the propagation of shocks during the Great Recession. So to be clear, we do not mean to argue that household balance sheets and financial intermediate balance sheets were unimportant. On the contrary, all the results I will show you are perfectly consistent with the view that the drop in house prices led to a drop in consumer demand, which ultimately led to a drop in employment, okay, which is essentially the, the Millon and Sufi view of the crisis. But the point is that households do not pay off workers. Firms do. Accordingly, the extent to which household demand shocks translate into employment losses should depend on how companies respond to these shocks. And so in this paper, we examine this question by using a unique data set that combines employment data at the establishment level, balance sheet data at the firm level, and house price data at the zip code and county level. So according to the firm balance sheet channel, uh, firm's responses to household demand shocks should depend on the strength of their balance sheet. And so earlier I showed you that the evolution of firm leverage was pretty much flat. And indeed, if you look at changes in leverage during the run of leading to the Great Recession, so from 2002 until 2006, uh, you will see that the median delta leverage is pretty much zero. But still, even though the median is zero, uh, it turns out that there is substantial cross-section variation in changes in leverage prior to the Great Recession. In other words, uh, some companies coming to the Great Recession having just tightened their debt capacity, whereas other firms uh, enter the Great Recession having just freed up their debt capacity. And so for lack of a better word, uh, we're going to refer to the first type of firms as high leverage firms, and the second type of firms as low leverage firms. And then the main finding of the paper is that uh, following household demand shocks, establishments of high leverage firms exhibit a significantly larger drop in employment compared to establishments of low leverage firms. And let me just make this main takeaway with a figure. So here you see um, two, two companies that could be companies from our sample. Okay, so the first one is a high leverage firm, the second one a low leverage firm. Let's assume that both companies have three establishments, uh, and let's say these two establishments are located in the same zip code, which experiences a large house price shock. And so what we find is that the, the drop in employment uh, is significantly larger at the establishment of the high leverage firm compared to the establishment of the low leverage firm. Okay, so in action, this is what we do in the paper. So let me very briefly uh, describe the data that we use. Uh, the establishment level data obtained from the Norwegian Business Database, the LBD, of the U.S. Census Bureau. And so this includes all business establishments in the U.S. that have at least uh, one paid employee. And here for your reference, you see the definition of an establishment. Uh, so this is a single physical location where business is conducted, so that could be, for example, a retail store, restaurant, gas station, manufacturing plant, and so on and so on. Then the balance sheet data obtained from CompuStat, and here we apply some data filters, so we're going to exclude financials, utilities, firms with missing accounting data, and then we simply match complete that with the LBD using the bridge of the US Census. House price data obtained from Zillow, and so what we do is we match establishments to, to house prices at zip code level, uh, and if the zip code data are missing, then we use house prices at the county level. And so that leads to our final sample, uh, which consists of 2,800 firms, corresponding to about uh, 285,000 establishments. 
In the regressions, the demand variable is the change in employment at the establishment level during the Great Recession. Okay, so from 07 until 09. Then the independent variable is the change in house prices at the zip code or in the county of the establishment. And here for consistency with the work of Mian and Sufi, we consider changes in house prices from December 2006 until December 2009. As I mentioned earlier, we classify firms as being high versus low leverage firms depending on whether they increase or decrease their debt capacity prior to the crisis, meaning based on changes in leverage from 02 until 06. They also mentioned that the, the median delta leverage is pretty much zero. Accordingly, what we do is very simple. So if delta leverage is above median, we say that this is a high leverage firm. Otherwise, we say that this is a low leverage firm. All right, let me show you some summary statistics, and then I'll show you uh, the results. So the, the first set of summary stats I would like to show you are at the establishment level. And so here you can see a bunch of characteristics. And so for each characteristics, we report the mean and segregation in parentheses. Okay, so here we see all establishments and then separately the establishment of high leverage firms and establishment of low leverage firms. So what do we see? Well, let me highlight a couple of things. So first of all, uh, we observe that the, the drop in employment during the, the Great Recession was significantly larger for establishments of high leverage firms. Okay, it was down by 9.2% compared to 7.4% for establishments of low leverage firms. Okay, so clearly employment is going down everywhere, but the drop in employment is larger at high leverage. Next, we observe that the, the drop in house prices during the bust was pretty much orthogonal to whether the company is high versus low leverage. Okay, so this is actually quite helpful because this implies that we won't need to worry about the possibility that perhaps the house price shock uh, was, was stronger for establishments of high leverage. In the next level, you can see some summary statistics uh, at the firm level. And so here, all the variables uh, are measured in 2006, so right before the Great Recession. As you can see, we observe that high leverage firms are leverage smaller, they are less profitable, and also they have higher leverage, and they appear to be more financially constrained on the basis of the white and green index and the Kaplan Zinger index. And finally, in the next table, you can see additional summary stats uh, at the firm level. So here, these are the same variables as before, but now instead of looking at them in 2006, we look at the change in those variables uh, between 0 to 0 6 during the, the run-up prior to the Great Recession. As you can see, we observe that high leverage firms have expanded more during the run-up. Uh, also, they have lower profitability growth, uh, and also they are becoming more and more financially constrained. Okay, so at this point, I think that the case is clear, right? So there are differences between high leverage firms and low leverage firms. Okay, that's not a big surprise. We get those differences, given that we don't have a randomized assignment of delta leverage uh, to companies. In particular, based on the summary stats, it seems plausible that high leverage firms uh, they may have increased their leverage because they had to finance uh, expansion projects or a deficit arising from a productivity shortfall. Now, of course, from an identification perspective, uh, this is going to raise the concern that perhaps high leverage firms are more responsive to household demand shocks, not so much because they are financially constrained, which is our story, but rather because perhaps they are less profitable or perhaps because they expanded too much uh, prior to the crisis. Uh, nevertheless, in the paper, we show that it is unlikely that those alternative stories are driving the results. And specifically, what we do is we run double sorts between uh, delta leverage and a bunch of other characteristics. And what we find is that what always matters is whether you're high versus low leverage, but not so much whether you're high versus low based on those characteristics. All right, then I'll show you the, the main results of the paper. So this is the main table. And so here we regress uh, changes in employment at the establishment level uh, during the crisis. Uh, on changes in uh, house prices at the zip code of the county of the establishment. And so in the first specification, we just run the background regression, uh, then we're going to put industry fixed effects, and then both industry and firm fixed effects. Okay, so here we see all establishments, and then separately the establishments of high versus low leverage. So what do we see? Well, first of all, when we look at all establishments, uh, we find that indeed a drop in house prices is associated with a drop in employment. So here, since we regress log in logs, uh, this implies that our coefficients have the interpretation of an elasticity. Okay, so specifically, they imply that a one-person drop in house prices corresponds to a drop in employment by 0.05 to 0.07%. Perhaps more informative is the interpretation if you go from the third quartile all the way down to the first quartile of the changes in house prices. So in this case, this corresponds to a drop in employment by 1 to 1.3%. Then when we look at establishments of high leverage firms, uh, we find that the effect is much larger and highly significant. Whereas for establishments of low leverage firms, we find that the effect is small and mostly insignificant. 
And so overall, these results are consistent with the firm balance sheet channel, according to which uh, high leverage firms are more responsive to ask questions. So in the previous table, we used sample splits to look at high versus low leverage firms. Uh, but of course, another thing that we can do is we can uh, pull all establishments together and then look at whether the effect is significantly larger for establishments of high leverage firms. This is what we do in this table. Okay, so here we have all establishments in the sample and now we look at the interaction between house price shops and a dummy that indicates whether the establishment belongs to a high leverage firm. As you can see, we find that regardless of the specification, the effect is always significantly larger for establishments of high leverage firms. Now, a nice feature of this specification uh, is that we can include more fixed effects. Okay, in particular, we can include zip code fixed effects and even zip codes by industry fixed effects. Okay, which is what we do uh, in, the, in the last column here, the most conservative specification. And so essentially here we are forcing the identification to come from comparing establishments in the same zip code and in the same industry. Okay, so in spirit, uh, this is closest to the code experiment I sketched earlier. We essentially we compare two establishments that are in the same industry, in the same zip code, but one belongs to a high leverage firm and the other one belongs to a low leverage firm. In the paper, we have uh, many extensions of the baseline analysis. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details here, but let me just briefly mention uh, what else we do. So first of all, we show that we obtain similar results uh, if we instrument changes in house prices with the housing supply elasticity of Albert Sachs, which is a very popular instrument in the literature <coughs> on the graph recession. Uh, also, we show that the results are robust if you use a panel instead of simply regressing deltas on them. Uh, we also get a very similar pattern if you look at what happens at the extensive margin. So if you look at the closure of establishments, as opposed to simply looking at changes in employment within existing establishments. Next, we look at how the effect differs across industry sectors. And here we contrast the, the tradable sector with the non-tradable sector. Okay, so you can think of tradable as being essentially manufacturing. Okay, so industries where the demand is global or nationwide. Whereas well, you can think of the non traditional sector as being, for example, retail and uh, restaurants. Okay, so industries where the demand is mostly local, uh, mostly local. And so what we find is that uh, there is virtually no relationship between house price shocks and employment uh, in the tradable sector, whereas there is a very strong relationship in the non tradable sector. Okay, so this is supporting our interpretation that those house price shocks are essentially like local household dimensions, right? Because if they are truly local dimensions then we expect to see an effect in industries where demand is local, but not in industries where demand is nationwide or global. And so for this reason, in the paper, uh, we use the expressions falling house prices and household demand shocks interchangeable, okay, which is also in line with the results of the analysis. And finally, we also look at the, the double sorts, which I mentioned earlier. All right, now let me show you some auxiliary, auxiliary evidence uh, that supports our interpretation that those companies that we classify as high leverage firms, uh, that they were indeed financially constrained during the Great Recession. So earlier, when we looked at the summary statistics, uh, we have seen that indeed uh, high leverage firms appear to be more financially constrained on the basis of popular indices of financing constraint, such as the index of Kevin Zingales and the index of Wagner. Another question is, uh, do high leverage firms also act like financially constrained firms? Okay, so for example, uh, do they have trouble raising additional, raising additional external finance? And so to examine whether this is the case, uh, what we do is we look at several firm level variables. And to do so, we're going to estimate firm level regressions that are similar uh, to our establishment level regressions. And so instead of looking at house price shocks at the establishment level, we're now going to look at the average house price shock across all establishments of the firm. Okay, and so if you want, this is uh, like looking at the average demand shock faced by the firm. And here's what we do. So first of, all, first of all, when you look at high leverage firms, uh, we find that indeed uh, they seem to behave like financially constrained firms. Okay, so they are unable to raise additional external financing, such as short-term debt and long-term debt. And so instead what they do is they fire workers, they close down establishments, and they cut on capital expenditures. In contrast, when we look at low leverage firms, we find that the exact opposite is true. So those firms, they don't fire workers, they don't close their establishments, and they don't cut on investment. Instead, what they do is uh, they increase their short-term and long-term borrowing. And so this is consistent with the view that uh, these firms, they simply use their debt capacity in order to weather the downturn. 
In the next table, you can see some additional evidence uh, along these lines. So here what we do is we run a typical internal capital market regression. And so specifically, we re-estimate our baseline regression at the establishment level. But now the difference is that instead of only looking at the house price shock at the location of the establishment, we also look at the average house price shock um, at the location of all the other establishments of the same firm. Okay, so the idea is that if a company is truly financially constrained, then how there be a negative shock at the other establishment, we'll have a negative spillover effect on the establishment in question. Okay, because companies may want to equate the marginal revenue product across all establishments. And this is exactly uh, what we observe. Okay, so we find that for high leverage firm, uh, there is indeed evidence for such negative spillover effect from the other establishment, uh, whereas we find no such evidence for low leverage. Next, let me show you some survey evidence that provides additional support for our interpretation. So, Campbell O'Brien and Harvey have a recent survey in the GFE in which they asked 574 US CFOs in 2008 uh, whether they feel that their firm is financially constrained and also what they plan on doing for 2009. What they find is that uh, about 65% of the CFOs said that they are either somewhat or very affected by financing constraints. The typical reasons that are indicated uh, include great rationing, high cost of borrowing, and difficulties in initiating or renewing a credit file. More importantly for us, uh, they find that financial constraint firms uh, said that they would cut capital spending by 9%. Whereas financially unconstrained firms said that they wouldn't cut on investment. And most importantly for us, uh, they find that financially constrained firms said that they would cut employment by 10.9%, whereas financially unconstrained firms said that they would cut employment only by 2.7%. And so it is very reassuring to see that the, the survey evidence matches up very nicely with what we observe in the data. All right, so finally, the, the last thing I would like to, to show you is that the, the firm balance sheet channel also has a great implication for employment at the county level. So do firms' balance sheets also matter for aggregate employment? Well, if we were to live in a world with a frictionless uh, labor market, then aggregate firm balance sheet shouldn't matter, right? Because what's going to happen is that wages would simply put just that one and then low leverage firms would just pick up the slack of high leverage firms. As a result, uh, aggregate employment uh, would change on a Having said this, uh, we have seen earlier that following household demand shocks, uh, low level firms do not increase employment. Accordingly, it seems very plausible and very likely that uh, firms' balance sheets will also matter in the aggregate. Okay, meaning areas with a larger fraction of establishments that belong to high level firms uh, should experience a larger drop in employment uh, following demand shocks. And so, to examine whether this is the case, uh, what we do is we estimate county level regressions looking at county level employment. And so here, very much like what we do at the firm level, when we look at high versus low leverage firms, we're going to look at high versus low leverage counties. Okay, we classify counties uh, based on two measures. The first one is the fraction of establishments in the county that belong to high leverage firms. And the second one, which we use for, for robustness, <coughs> is the average value of data leverage across all of the county's establishments. Okay, then what we do is very simple. So we say that the county is a high leverage county if the respective measure uh, lies above the median across all counties. And here's what we find uh, when we use the, the first measure. Uh, we get very similar results if you use the, the second measure. So first of all, uh, as you can see, we observe that indeed, um, as price shocks uh, are associated with a drop in employment uh, across all counties. Now, more interestingly, when we look at high versus low leverage counties, uh, we find that the effect uh, appears to be larger for high leverage counties. Okay, indeed, if you look at the, the last column uh, where we run the interaction, uh, you see that indeed uh, the effect is significantly larger for high leverage counties. Okay, so overall, this evidence suggests that indeed uh, the firm balance sheet channel has implication for aggregate employment. All right, so let me conclude. Uh, so in this paper, we show that firms' balance sheets uh, were instrumental in the propagation of shocks during the Great Recession. And accordingly, an implication of the paper is that uh, the employment losses during the Great Recession were the products of both weak household balance sheets and weak firm balance sheets. Accordingly, and this is my final implication, uh, when we think about the Great Recession, uh, it might be helpful to have a model in mind in which household balance sheets, financial intermediaries, balance sheets, and firms' balance sheets interact with each other. 
Thank you very much. Okay, um, well, thank you for having me here. I want to say, uh, first and foremost, this is a very interesting paper to read. Um, Xavier did a great job kind of summing it up, and so I'm not going to spend any time doing that, partly because I have 10 minutes and I didn't prep a slide. All right, but I want to say it, it is a great paper for two reasons. One, super easy to read. It was well written, and at the same time, it's a very interesting topic, right? This is something we've been talking about a lot lately, and it's a completely different view on it. Now, at the same time, while it was very interesting to read, a little more challenging to discuss. Uh, and the reason why is, even though I would think this is kind of a, an early draft, it's only been shot at three different conferences, or, three, or sorry, three different presentations. They have 11 tables, an IV, five more robustness in the internet, and the so as a discussion, it's, it's a little bit tougher to, uh, to say, well, no, this is the, this is the hole in the story. But my uh, in conclusion, didn't really find a hole. Right? So there's a couple things I do want to offer as thoughts and suggestions to think about. But there's nothing that is a silver bullet that says, no, this can't be what's going on. All right? And the first is, and Zavi you did a good point of, of kind of mentioning this, these are two inherently different types of firms. right? Some of these have just increased their leverage. Others have just decreased their leverage. And you see differences among higher growth rates on these guys, higher wages, et cetera. Now, when I first read this, my natural curiosity was, well, if these firms are changing. What does this look like on the aggregate? So what it, on the aggregate, are there employment effects of these increasing leverage and decreasing leverage firms? Now, while I don't have Census Bureau data, you can do a lot of this in CompuSet, which is our, our standard stuff. So what I want to do is just to get a perspective and give you an idea of the scope of this, what did the average employment effects look like between these two groups for the period that they're looking at? All right, so this is taking the same set of uh, screens Everything except for, I'm including a couple more firms that probably didn't match into the, the BLS data, so I didn't have that restriction. Everything else is the same. And you do find that if you look at the change in employment for the high leverage and the low leverage firms, you're going to get this dot right here, which says that high leverage firms, relative to low leverage firms, decrease their employment by about four and a quarter percent at that point in time. Now, at the same time, this is right after the financial crisis. Natural Curiosity says, what happened at other points in time? What happened in the 80s and the 90s? But fortunately, with the CompuSet data, you can do this, right? You can run this doing rolling windows over this entire period, and you get something like this. Now, what I want you to, to notice is that throughout the entire period, and it goes up and down through time, through crises, and in good times and bad times, you're going to see that high leverage firms, relative to their low leverage counterparts, do have a decrease in the, in the relative amount of people they're either increasing employment by or they are cutting employment by more than their high leverage, low leverage counterparts. But what I really want to put this up for is to say that, look, during this financial crisis, if this is our, our point estimate, what Xavier is showing is this cross-sectional effect makes up a good portion of it. It's over 30 to 40 percent, depending on which coefficient you're using. So a lot of this is explained by these cross-sectional demand shocks. I just want to give you a little perspective of that. Now, as I go through my main points, I really have three. The first is that it's to hit on this, well, these are growing firms. So naturally, what they show is that these firms do have uh, an increase in their growth rates. They're increasing their establishments. Their capex is going up, assets are going up as well. Now, the concern is, are they growing in certain areas that are naturally susceptible to these demand shocks, right? What they do show in the paper, though, is that housing supply elasticity is the same for these high and low leverage groups. So it doesn't appear to be right at the crisis in 07 that these firms are in inherently different places, that they're overexposed in certain ranges. Now, one caveat is, I think this is for establishments that survived through 09. That was the only thing I wasn't clear about. So it could be that their 07, all establishments are slightly different in that way, and it's just relative Relatively speaking, all firms that lasted 09, they have the same supply elasticity. Right now, at the same time, natural question is, are high leverage firms expanding into these booming years? Just because in 07 they had the same characteristics, it doesn't mean that in 06 or 05 or 04, they may have been in more low growth areas and they're, they're kind of expanding into this period. Right? They're expanding into these certain sectors and certain uh, geographic regions that are booming, right? And the implications of this are, well, is this unhealthy growth that they're just trying to, to pick up on booming areas like Las Vegas and, and Orange County? 
And also, are there consumer Lloyd's effects? If I think about where I'm shopping, I'm going to go to the same place over and over. If I go to J. Crew to buy my shirts, probably going to continue to go there, even if Banana Republic opens up next door. Right? But there are some easy ways to, to address this, or at least show that this isn't the case. And the first is to show that not that the housing supply, housing supply elasticity was the same cross section in 07, but that the changes between these two groups from 02 to 06 didn't change, right? Because in 02, you had a dispersion of establishments for the high and low leverage groups. In 06, you had a different dispersion. What are the characteristics of these two in terms of how they're growing into different areas? Is that the same? But it's something that's very easily addressed. The second one, which may be kind of a taller task because I'm not aware if this is in the status set, would be a natural control for this consumer loyalty. Would it be to have an establishment level age control, right? Are these establishments that are only a year or two years old, or have they been there for a while? This is something, I don't know if it's a limitation of the data, it may be something that's not doable, okay? Now the next thing that I want to talk about, and I know this is getting a little, it's a little on the, the detail side, is just the way the, the empirics are set up. So in this framework, what we're looking at is logged employment changes, we're looking at log house pricing changes. Right now, given the primary variable interest is this log employment, there's some things I kind of want to talk about in terms of what this is going to lead to in your results, in your point estimates, if we do care about the actual coefficient, if we're trying to measure this precisely. And the first is that logged employment changes, what this is going to do is it's actually going to bias upwards the results in certain scenarios. So if you plotted percentage change in employment on the x-axis, and on the y-axis you did this logging changes, at the small effects, at 1 and 2 percent changes, it's going to track really well. It's going to be on the 45 degree line. Now as you start to increase the amount of the change, 50 percent decrease in employment, this thing is going to shoot up pretty quickly. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to bias in terms of a bigger effect than you would think. Now there's no reason to think that this is actually going to affect its results in terms of high and low leverage firms because what you would need is the high leverage firms to be in areas where there is a bigger dispersion in this percentage change to bias that differentially than the low leverage firms, right? But the easy fix for this in terms of that dispersion is just to aggregate these things up to the firm level by zip or firm by zip level, right? If we have 10 establishments in the same zip code, they all have the same X variables, it's not clear what it's really buying is some power. So you can just aggregate these things up to all the employees of this firm at this zip code in 07, then in 09, and it's going to get rid of some of these big effects by a firm going from 10 employees to 5, because you're looking at all the establishments for that firm. Now, the, the even simpler fix, what I want to su suggest is that why don't we just look at percentage changes in employment? It's not this log. And the reason why is one of the big downsides of using this log change is you can't include 100% decreases in employment. So basically, if an establishment closes down, they go from 100 employees to zero, there's no log of zero, right? So it's undefined. We can't use in the regression at all. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to, and we know this is the case, there was 53,000 establishments that closed in the sample period based on the two sets of number of observations that I looked at. So this is going to have some effects. So what it's actually going to do is all these people, all these firms who close down establishments, it's not actually going to show up in a thing, but it's an easy fix. Right? If you include just percentage change in employment, you can take care of firms who have closed down an establishment. You have a 100% drop in your employment in that area. Okay? So, pretty easy thing. And the last thing that we want to talk about is, as Xavier mentioned, there were some alternative explanations that they wanted to test. One of these was these firms did pay higher wages going into the crisis. Slightly higher, it wasn't, p-value wasn't great, so it's not like they're clearly different firms for that reason. But I had some thoughts on this. Um, one, or I'll, I guess I'll say the minor conference thing is, I think this is done across all firms in the sample, the way this cut is. It's going to look at firms that pay above and below wage, average wages, along with firms that are high and low leverage. Now my concern is, is this really addressing the question that we're concerned about? If we're thinking about Kmart and Walmart, who maybe Kmart's trying to grow, they're trying to pull in employees and so they're giving higher wages, they're more exposed to the crisis. Well, does this really get at that? If I'm thinking that's a story that it's Kmart paying above 
Walmart's wages going into the crisis, well, it seems like the, a better way to do this or, or a way to kind of get at this alternative explanation would be to look at these sample cuts at the industry level. So you're looking at these retailers, Kmart, Walmart, Target, who's paying above, above and below average wages within that sector. And you're going to say, well, there are industry fixed effects, but that's going to take care of levels. It's not going to take care of this cross-sectional elasticity. And so if you are concerned about that, I think this is something that kind of needs to be done, and it needs to be, it could be done for wages, for the, the change in assets, uh, change in growth, all these other cross-sectional independent sorts. Okay, and then just one minor comment, and this is, it's not going to change results at all. Just something I noticed. If you look at the standard deviation of these wages, it's 10 times that of the mean, which makes me think, I think it is actually picking up executives as well. I don't know if there's an easy way to, to exclude these guys. If you can say, for instance, drop any establishment where the average wage is above 100,000, just to take care of this, if there's any kind of weird behavior with the, the executives, the CEOs getting decreases in pay, things like that. It's not going to change results at all, just something to consider. And there's a couple minor points, but I will leave those out because I know we're all kind of hungry at this point. Um, but all in all, I think it's a great paper. Uh, it's definitely something that we care about the, uh, the area. And this gives us additional information, kind of expanding the knowledge in this field. I don't know how to close this.